Hey, how you doing? My name is Pastor Yaku Shelley. I'm the senior pastor of the Hand of the Lord International. I want to thank you guys for uh, tuning in and following us on today. Uh, we ran into a couple of difficulties uh, dealing with YouTube, so our, ex our team did an excellent job by switching us over uh, to make sure you guys was able to get the Word of God on today, so we thank God for that opportunity. Uh, I want to uh, pick up, as we've been uh, ministering and sharing uh, on a series called First Fruits, we've been doing this on Sundays as well as Wednesdays, but on our Wednesdays, we say uh, it's First Fruits one-on-one, -on -one, which means that we give the opportunity for Q&A. So, uh, uh, not quite sure how th this piece is set up, but in your comment section, if you're following us, uh, you have uh, any questions, feel free to go into the comment side, uh, type in your questions. We have moderators here who would then in turn let me know the question that you have. Uh, my only uh, stipulation is that you would keep the questions centered around the topic that we're share sharing. Uh, so just for those who may just be tuning in for the first time, uh, as well as those who are giving you time to uh, get over from YouTube, I'm pretty sure they'll let you guys know about that part. Uh, we want to do a quick, quick recap. As we've been using on our Wednesdays, Joseph, the dreamer, as our uh, background, uh, as our canvas and sharing where the first fruit is. Anytime God gets ready to take you to another level, he increases your life. First fruits is always connected to increase. Anytime God increases you, uh, then he, in turn, you hit that level of increase, he requires a first fruit from you. Uh, first, it can deal with substance, but it also can deal with people. As the word of God tells us that the, our Lord Jesus Christ was our first fruits. So that the father desired to have other sons and daughters, he used Christ to be uh, the one that uh, came before us. And he gave himself up so that he can have other sons and daughters. So he was our first fruit offering. For as a quick, quick recap, I want to, if you're following along, I want you to turn to Genesis uh, 41. That would be our key text on today. We'll deal with uh, Genesis 41, beginning at verse 46. But I want to do a quick recap uh, in dealing with life with Joseph. If you're taking notes, please write this down um, or just, you know, look over your past notes and follow along. Uh, as we look at this, we see that... Um, Joseph uh, is now, by the time we get to Genesis 41 and 46, he's 30 uh, years old. When we first start reading about him and, and following, tracking his life, we see that uh, Joseph's 30 years old at this moment. We already have established the fact that 30 is the number of maturity for ministry. So if you study number 30, it's going to take you to being mature for ministry. It doesn't mean that you have to be 30 years old, but it just shows using Christ as an example that at 30, he began his ministry. At uh, David began to reign also at 30. So there's biblical examples that, that God used the number 30 uh, to show maturity for ministry. Now, when we look at this, it's important important that we look at the fact that there has to be a maturing in anything that God desires to do in your life. If he, let's use ministry for instance. If you believe that you're called uh, to do something unique for God, that you may be assigned to be a first fruit offering, there has to be a level of maturity to you. One of the things that I see is that a person may get a word from the Lord or get prophesied to on a Sunday and, and and say that God wants to do this, all of a sudden they believe when they wake up Monday that it's time to do it. That's not the case. Uh, God can speak something over your life, but it has to be a maturing, uh, maturation process that, that happens. If you look at the female, uh, women are born with eggs uh, in them. Uh, from my understanding, what we've been taught, they don't recreate them. But at a woman at, uh, or a female at one month years old, one month, is not able to have a baby, even though she possesses eggs. She must first reach a level of maturity. She must go through puberty. And just because she began to go through puberty doesn't mean she's ready to be a mom. Her body may be able to uh, conceive, but there are other things that need to take place in her and with her before she's ready to be a mother. So it is as we deal with ministry, and ministry is just serving, all right? I don't, I don't want to reduce it to you getting up in a pulpit or, or you in front of a crowd. Anytime you're serving and doing the will of God, that is ministry. Some people are called to serve behind the scenes, others in front. But it, it, I don't believe it means that I'm better than you if I'm doing one or the other. It just means that, that God has graced us to fulfill uh, his assignment on our life. So when we look at this, we see that Joseph, when we look at Genesis 37 uh, and verse 2, Joseph is 17 years old. 
uh, he receives now a double dream. We have already established that God uses at least two or three witnesses to establish his word. So they, Joseph, I'm sorry, has a double dream. Uh, by the time we get to Genesis 37 and 28, he is sold into slavery. So he tells his brother, his mom and dad about his dream. Brothers get jealous. They sell him into slavery. By the time we get to Genesis 30, 39 and 1, we see that, that Joseph is in Egypt. He's down at Potiphar's house. Potiphar had a position in the army. Uh, we see that God uses Joseph in Potiphar's house. God began to bless Potiphar's house because of Joseph. Well, uh, what tends to happen by the time we get to verse 20 of 39, we see that Joseph is in prison. Uh, Potiphar's wife uh, desires to sleep with Joseph. Joseph refused. She then tells uh, a lie and says that Joseph tries to rape her. So now he's put in prison uh, uh, for something he didn't do. But while he's in prison and we get to Genesis 40 and 9, we see that there uh, the, ba the baker and the butler of Pharaoh is now in the prison. And they also have a dream, uh, both dream that night, again, double dream. And Joseph now begins to interpret the dream for them. But at this time uh, in Joseph's life, he's 28 years old. So he has been in Egypt for the last 11 years. Uh, and Joseph even says uh, to the butler, that he wants to get out. I'm wrongly accused. I want to. I want to get out. But there's a two-year wait. And by the time we get to Genesis chapter 41, we see that God ministers to Pharaoh uh, through a double dream. So uh, we establish the fact that that uh, Joseph expressed in chapter 40, he's ready to get out of jail. But there's another another two years that happen. We establish the fact that if Joseph would have got out two years prior, he would ha he would have been obsolete. Why? Because what needed to take place is is that Pharaoh needed to have a dream that no one else can interpret in order for Joseph to be uh, valuable, in order for him to be needed. Had he been uh, positioned in front of Pharaoh two years prior, Pharaoh would not need his gift. He would not need his grace. And so Joseph uh, would have missed out on the assignment of God. And what I want you to understand that that stop uh, running from the process, no matter what it is that we have been assigned to do, God is going to take you through a process. He's going to take me through a process. He's going to take anybody that you know through, through a process. The problem is not the process as much as it is us yielding to the process. Uh, we live in a society that every, everybody wants everything fast. How quick can you get it, whether it be Internet speed, how, uh, uh, my phone uh, doing, or uh, using pressure cookers and microwave. All of these things is how fast can I get? I want the result, but I need to do it fast. I want it quicker than before. And, and what I t typically see when I look at the body of Christ, uh, we had a group of individuals that went through a maturation process that it took years, uh, even though they may have been called to uh, preach. They didn't start out preaching day one. They cleaned bathrooms. They cut grass. They, they ushered. They did other things, and they showed themselves faithful a few things before God can make them rule over many. But what is happening is that people are, are, are saying, I'm called, and I need to be doing it right now without that maturing process and so they begin to do certain things and now we're br we're bringing a black eye to the body of Christ why because there's a lot of people uh with a lot of shine but the lack of maturity and so when you understand this you 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 stop asking God to fast track your life and I want to share this with you for those of you who are tithers those of you who sow into the kingdom if you read Malachi 3 Here's what you're actually sowing. You're sowing that God keeps you on his timetable. Now, I know many of you may not look at it like that, but if you read Malachi 3, it says that he, he would not let the fruit catch his vine before, uh, before the time in the field, says the Lord of hosts, which means that now you're sowing to wait on God's timing. And so now those of us who, who begin to mature in this, you recognize that I may want something out of my flesh, but I'm more concerned with being in the timing of God that I don't just get something without being ready for it, okay? And so you ask God to build you. And this is I want to I want to say that to lead up to this, because now Pharaoh has his God ministers to Pharaoh in a dream. But by the time we get to Genesis 41, 40 through 45, and I want you to uh, uh, catch this, we see that the outside now catches up with the inside. I want to say that again. We see that the outside now catches up with the inside. So so two two days prior, Joseph was in jail. Pharaoh calls for Joseph to get out of jail. He gets out of jail, and they and the Bible says they hastily came and got him. So Joseph could not get out on his own, but now they they are quickly getting him out. He shaves, he put on apparel, goes before Pharaoh. 
But at this time, he's 30 years old. Now, the 17-year-old Joseph was gifted. He was called, but he wasn't ready. Because when we see him at 17, he makes the dream about him. But now at 30, he gives all the glory back to God. These 13 years being in Egypt has gotten Joseph to, to trust God through the process. Now, had, had, had God put Joseph in front of Pharaoh at 17 years old, he would have blew everything. Too, too immature. But at 30, he's now ready for the process. He, he's ready for the uh, promotion because he's been through the process. So what happens is that instantly after he says this, he gives Pharaoh, watch this, he gives Pharaoh what's going to happen, what the dreams meant, and how he should handle the famine that's about to come. He even suggests to Pharaoh that now you need a person who is qualified in these areas to benefit you uh, moving forward. And here's the thing that I want to uh, in also, challenge someone's heart. Be careful uh, when you are serving someone else's vision and you tell them things that they could do to benefit their vision. But you are the sole person that gets it done. In other words, you, you propose it something, but you propose it under the emphasis of I could do this or I could do that. And, and you want to be careful on that because here's the thing that I want you to see. If you're really mature, you should be able to go to your job or employer or anybody that you're working with. Give them suggestions on improving, but leave, leave it up to them to decide who they want to run it. Now, now watch what I'm telling you. Be careful when you have a suggestion for something, but you are the sole person that can get it done. If, if it's really something that can benefit the company, the person who runs the company should be allowed to choose who they want to do that part. And so the, one of the things that I see that's amazing that people have suggestions with stuff, but in their suggestions, they're the one who's going to get the glory from it. But notice Joseph doesn't even uh, suggest himself. He just said, here's the character characteristics of the person that you're going to that you need to have in your corner during this time. And it is Pharaoh who decides, you know what, I don't have to look that far because I see you being the man. I see you being the one. He then takes the ring off. He get off his hand. He gives uh, Joseph jewelry. He gives him royal apparel. He gives him a chariot. Watch this. And then in verse 45, he does what? He gives him a wife. So now we see a man that a week before was in jail serving time for a crime he did not commit. We see him now. He, he, is, he is decked out, if you would, using our, our vernacular in, in, from Decatur, Georgia. He is decked out with gold. He is decked out with new apparel. He has a car, chariot, if you would. He has transportation. And watch this. He now has a wife. All these things that Pharaoh has given him. So what I, what I want you to understand, the reason that, that I don't believe that we should spend all of our time asking God to give us exter uh, external things is because using Joseph as a backdrop, God changed his whole life externally. Externally, in a matter of moments. But you know what took long? It took the 13 years to get him mature to handle what God was about to do. So if I spend all my time begging God to give me stuff, really I'm showing him I'm not ready. A mature person says, God, work in me to prepare me for what you want to do in my life. Because God can let let you work for 13 years and stuff just closing in on you. And then one phone call, everything in your life shifts. Everything you've been waiting God, for God to do, he can do just like that. And we see it happening with Joseph. And so now I want to just get, catch you up to speed. So now as we're in verse 46, I'm still in Genesis 41. We're in verse 46. Look what happens. It says Joseph was uh, 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Joseph went out, watch this, from the presence of Pharaoh, and he went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, here's a man, watch this, two days before he was stuck in jail, all he could do is roam the prison. But now he is Roman Egypt. All right. So some of you feel like you've been stuck. You well, well I, I felt like God want me to travel. He want me to do this. Here's the thing you got to understand that is coming. Your, your season is coming. So you could be stuck for a minute and then all of a sudden God open open this door. But watch this. And here's what I have to be honest with. I don't know about your life. I have to be honest with the things that, that God held up for me that when he finally gave it to me, I had a greater appreciation for it. I, I was able to handle it better I, because I recognized it wasn't me doing it. If God would have done what you wanted him to do prior to now, you would have taken the glory for it. You would have said, look at me. Look at I commanded my day. And because I commanded my day, these things are happening. Or I put this vision board together. And, and because I put this vision board together and I laid hands on it, look what happened. So God allowed you to do 
all those things and it don't turn out the way that you want it to. But now if he bless your life, what's going to happen? You're going to give him all the glory. And so God does that. And watch this. The verse 47 says in the seven plenteous years, watch this, the earth brought forth by handfuls. Look what happened in these seven years. For those who've been following us, understand that Joe says it's going to be seven years of plenty. Then it's going to be seven years of famine. Watch this. Verse 48 says he gathered up. I want you to bracket that off. He gathered up. And if you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. He saved all the food of the seven years which were in the land of Egypt. Watch this. Laid up. That's the saving part. The food in the cities and the food in the field which were around about every city laid he up in the same. Watch this. So, so going back to the, the solution he told Pharaoh. He told Pharaoh to lay aside a fifth part which means 50 20% of what come in during the seven years of plenty, let's, let's save 20% of that. And, and God is speaking to somebody about what he's, he's got about to do in your life that as he begins to increase you, because I don't want to get too far ahead of my, myself, but I want you to start preparing to sit aside at least 20% of what God's about to release in your life. For some of you, it's going to be even more. If you would, I'm, I'm thinking about the 80-20 rule. And some of you are, and I want you to be prepared for this. You, you're going to be in a season where you're going to live off the 20%. You're actually going to do other stuff with the 80. So, so don't get so uh, reduced to, okay, I'm going to live off the 80 and then I'm just going to say the 20 because God may flip that with you and say, you know what, with well, what you're bringing in, can you live off 20? And I want you to do something else with the 80. Watch this, watch this, watch this. And, and Joseph, now he had this thing that he put in Egypt, but I, but I like the fact that he did it in every city. And I'm going to go back to that. Watch this. And Joseph, I'm on verse 49. And Joseph gathered corn as the sand of the sea very much until he left numbering. Watch this. For it was without number. So, in other words, God began to bless, uh, 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 allow the blessing to flow to such a degree that he started out numbering, but it came in so much, so fast, that he started losing track, number-wise, what God was uh, releasing. And so, watch this. Here's the thing that I need you to see. Can you allow the Holy Spirit to take you, let's use just round numbers, let's say, for instance, you're making uh, $100,000, and I had people say, well, I just want to make six figures. So say, for instance, you're making $100,000 a year. You're making $100,000 a year, but you begin to hit a season, watch this, to now wh whereby you're making $2.5 million. Okay, watch this. You was used to making $100,000, now you're making two point five. dollars And here's where most people miss it. As they make the two point five, dollars now they lose track of what it was like when they had the 100000 Not understanding that doing the 100000 was your season of testing. He was trying to put something in your heart that when the numbers start to increase, you already have wisdom to... to on what to do with the increase that comes and, and people who have a poverty mindset miss miss this right here because what they do is they ask God for more but if you track their life they say well God they were making 25,000 if I just made 50 I'd be straight they make 50 and they still end up living from paycheck to paycheck go from 50 to 100 still living from paycheck to paycheck why because it's a mindset that has never shifted even though the numbers have shifted the mindset haven't shifted but watch this what God has been trying to do in you is shift your mindset that if he increase your numbers your mind has already been shifted for the increase and you're able to maximize what God put in your, your hand I'm not saying that when he take you through this season of increase you can't go buy some clothes you can't go buy a car you can't get a new house I'm not saying that you can't do those things but here's what God has been showing someone Every spending that you do, now you are used to spending, watch this, with an invest, investor mindset. And here's what I mean. You don't just go and get a car just to say you got a car. You get a car based upon what you need the car to do, watch this, to now generate more income. So in other words, you, you, you don't go buying a car just to go and buy a car. You may buy a car, pay cash for it. Let's say you want to get something, let's say it's $100,000. You pay cash for it, but you put it in your business name, and then you turn around and take the car that's in your business name and lease it back to you. Because you put the car in your business name, that's 100% write-off. Because you lease it back to yourself, you can write that off up to $18,500 uh, car credit that you get every year. So basically, here's what happened. You fronted the 100000 but on your taxes, you're able to get it back. So basically, here's what happened. You All year, you basically roll for free. You just put the money up in advance. You see the difference in that? Then somebody's going to get a loan. Now they're paying 
a, 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 a car loan every month trying to build their credit but when in actuality I don't have to worry about that if, I, if I'm able to have enough to where my, I put it in my company name lease it back to me all I'm saying is this I'm able to ride what I want to ride, but I get it back at the end of the year. So, it, so basically, I just roll for free. It's a mindset, guys. That's what I'm trying to show you. It's a mindset. Um, also, this is this is something that 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 is really on my heart, and I've been praying about that. I find this difficult. Uh, is uh, we're dealing, and, and, and my heart go out to those who, who've lost loved ones to uh, police brutality, uh, through racism, hate. And this is something that has hit a uh, uh, black community ever since we have uh, came over here uh, in this country. So this is something that's been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, and I recognize as we talk about gaining wealth that systematically uh, people are locked out of certain opportunities to make sure that you never obtain a certain level of wealth. And, and, and I understand that it comes from people from a certain persuasion, but here's the thing also that my heart ate. It, we also hold ourselves back with our mindset. I, I uh, tried to uh, start this investment group and uh, with, the, with this particular opportunity of uh, I recognize that if you took a million dollars and, and you and put it on in a certain uh, banking instrument, let, I'm using round numbers. Let's say, for instance, that million dollars in 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 40 weeks or consider 10 months uh, could turn over into 2.5 million dollars. Okay. Now, what I recognize in doing this is that if I had two million, two million wouldn't give me the double of that one. And in other words, if I had one, I had 2.5. If I have two, then I have 5 million. That's not the case. What I recognize is, is that if I had 2 million instead of one, not only would, would I um, have not the double, but more. In other words, the 1 million would give me 2.5. But if I had 2 million, it would give me 6. Watch this. Here's my point. What I was seeking to do is develop a, a, a team of investors that now if people want to do investing, they could invest with people that they trusted, whereby the, the overall goal is to build as much as we can to do bigger things. Watch me. Follow me for a minute. So if you took that one person, instead of them investing $1 million, getting 2.5, they partner with someone else and that that two million dollars yields six million dollar return. Now each person now walks away with three million dollars through. Watch this, and this is biblical. This is how this stuff set up through the power of agreement, right? Here's the, here's what I found out. You could de you could desire that all you want, and and we're not dealing with systematic uh, racism, but a poverty mindset of people that some people, if you try to take them to that, they will not be able to follow you. They would not be able to do it. They would not be ready for it. And this has nothing to do with nobody else from another race. It has everything to do with their mindset. Because of their mindset, they are not ready. Now, here's the crazy part. Everybody say they want it, but everyone cannot ha handle it. And, and here's the thing. So what, what, one of the things that hurt my heart is that when certain opportunities come in my life, I'm going to give them a share. I want to see everybody win. But what I recognized through a certain um, private experience was you can desire something for somebody that they themselves cannot handle. And then the moment you try to take somebody there, watch this, externally, without them changing on the inside, you're really causing problems. You'll put a person in the worst situation because money only make you more what you are. You, you already are. And so what I recognize is that we're in a situation whereby systematically we've been oppressed to, to keep moving forward financially, but we also hold ourselves back. And that's something that we have to be honest about that cannot really handle the stuff that I'm asking God for. The only way you can you can uh, uh, be honest with yourself, you have to look at your level of maturity. How are you handling things right now? And watch this. So Joseph had the grace on his life. His dad was grooming him to take over the family business. We see that when he got to Potiphar's house, he managed Potiphar's stuff right, got to the prison, and the prison would look like a step down. He managed the prison right. So now he's in front of Pharaoh, but look at all of these things that he had to first prove himself and get learning from. And that's that's what I'm that's the, the thing that, that eats away at my heart that when people have opportunity to learn, they run from opportunity to learn because watch this, they are inconvenienced. They're inconvenienced people are not treating them right so they they jump ship run from the opportunity to learn and now when they get a chance to get in front of pharaoh they don't have any skill set they haven't matured they haven't uh hadn't been prepared but they everybody want the increase but we don't want the process and so 
look what happens. Joseph goes around to every city. And here's the, here's the thing I want to point out. He goes around to every city and he implements a system that is going to benefit everybody. Increase is coming. Everybody's enjoying themselves. But Joseph recognized this is not going to last forever. I want to speak into the heart of somebody. Here's the thing that I want you to understand. You're, you, you could, God could be preparing you to go into a season of increase unlike anything that you've ever seen. But here's what I want you to understand. It is a season. It is a season. When I when I let's use athletes for instance, you have a, a person that grew up in the hood. Now they're making millions of dollars playing a sport. And here's what we say from a poverty mindset: so and so have made it. No, they have not. I don't care how much they are making. If they are a W two employee, which means that at any given time another person can stop their their income from coming in, they have not made it. It don't matter how big the check is. You got to look at the overall scope of it. If they're making five million dollars a year, but somebody can come in and say right now. We're cutting your contract and that five million that they make a year stops immediately. They have not made it. They have not arrived. But in, in certain communities, what will happen is we will exalt. Watch this. We will exalt that high class employee. We will exalt that high class empl employee. Now, everybody around and watch this are not looking to make them better. Everybody got their hand out and say, hey, all right, buddy, you got five million dollars because I saw it on TV. Have you ever wondered why an athlete? When he gets paid or they get a, get, he get a contract, they make it public for everybody. But somebody else can go in another arena. They can get paid closed deals and we never hear about how much they're getting paid. Guys, you got to understand the system that we're in. The system is this. Look, we're paying you $5 million. Ownership. The, 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 the owner of the team say we own you. The fans say we own you. Because we... By bought tickets, we are paying your five million dollars. So if we're paying you five million dollars. Watch this. We now deem that you need to entertain us more because we are paying your salary. Watch this. Not only do we see that, no one is talking about from a, a perspective of well, how much is being um, taken from them? What, what tax bracket are they in? Guys, when you really start breaking this down, your heart will go out to, to people that, that actually uh, are professional athletes because you get to see that this system that's set up is not set up for them to be rich and have long-lasting wealth. It's just exploitation. I'm, I'm, that's the truth of the matter. And, and I, I, I can have this conversation with whoever who, who disagree with me. But the thing is, now... Everybody's pulling from that person who has not been educated financially with financial literacy. So guess what they do? They get it and blow through it. They start buying all these crazy things that they don't need. They run straight through it. And the people around them help them run straight through it. But watch this. The moment they get cut, now you lose your job, you go on Facebook and tell everybody you lost your job. That's how we know we, you lost your job. Imagine working that the moment you get cut, and some people find this out, they get cut through social media or it, it runs across ESPN. Now, everybody know that you lost your job. Imagine how embarrassing that is. I want to stop for a minute uh, for a question that's uh, been sent in. This question is from Charmaine White. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, people that have increased and still live at a level that is comfortable to them are pegged as scared to spend for fear of going broke. What's wrong with making six figures, but you live like you're only making five figures? Mm -hmm. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, Charmaine. Thank you for the question. Uh, what I would suggest is execute your plan. Have a plan before the stuff start coming. All right. And it's, it's, it's great to increase uh, with that plan, but have a plan and stick with that plan. Do not be uh, caught up with trying to please the Joneses. I don't care. I don't care what you drive. I don't care what you where you live. But what I want to encourage you to do is stick with your plan. In other words, here's the thing. It, it's OK to live like you still making five and somebody else say, well, you're, you're scared. But guess what? This this 40 uh, percent that I'm saving, I'm now taking 25 of that 40 percent. And now I'm, I'm investing in this particular venture. I'm taking that other 15 percent and I'm directing it toward 
toward this, this, and this. Or if you take the other 40% and set it over into the bank. My point is, execute your plan. Come up with a plan. Come up with a strategy. And that's something that Joseph did. Joseph had a strategy and a plan before everything happened. Before, before the plenteous took place and what we'll begin to read, before the famine took place, Joseph had a plan. And here's the, here's the thing that I want you to see. Joseph is the only one in Egypt executing that plan. He's the only one executing the plan. Pharaoh is not on the plan. The people in the city is not on the plan, but it is Joseph who is executing the plan. And so that's what I want to encourage someone to do. Seek God for a plan. And when he, you should, here, here's the thing, let me say it like this. You should have a plan before the resources come. If you automatically have a plan, once the resources come, you didn't have a plan. So, it, it, cause in other words, here's the thing, you're waiting on something happening. And, and, and now, which is connected to happiness, which I'm going to go into, I'm going to let, let I'm going to say it way into something that I want you to see connected to this. Verse 50 says, and unto Joseph was born two sons before the years of famine. So now Joseph get married to Asna and he, who the daughter of Potiphar, who was the priest of Ona, he came from the city of Ona, bound to him. And watch this, verse 51 says, and Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh for God, here's the meaning, have made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. So Manasseh basically means to forget, okay? So watch this. Verse 52 says, And the name of the second was called Ephraim. And for God have caused me to be fruitful, watch this, in the land of my affliction. The first son is named God has caused me to forget. The second son is named I am fruitful in the place that I have been afflicted. I need you to get this, guys. I want you to write this down because this is so key right now in the time that we're in. First thing I want you to see is the first thing he says that God made me forget. Now, I want you to, I want you to write this down. Increase, increase of today can cause you to forget yesterday. The increase of today can cause you to forget yesterday. The increase of today can cause you to forget yesterday. The increase of today can cause you to forget. We can say, even say, the pain of yesterday. All right? The increase of today can cause you to forget the pain of yesterday. That is very much possible. Also, I want you to, I want to, I want you to write this down, though. The loss of today can cause you to forget the happiness of yesterday. So the first thing was the increase of today can cause you to, as I'm writing this down, as I'm talking to you, uh, uh, the increase of today can cause you to forget the pain of yesterday. All right. And the loss of today can cause you to forget the happiness of yesterday. The loss of today can cause you to forget the happiness of yesterday. Pastor Shelley, what do you mean by that? I don't know if they're able to put it up on the screen, but John, I think John 16, St. John 16, 21, explains this great. And here's what it says for those uh, who are not familiar with the verse. Jesus is talking in St. John chapter 16, verse 21. Here's what he says. A woman, when she is in travail, watch this, has sorrow. A woman, when she is travailing, getting ready to have a baby, has sorrow. So it should hurt you. You should feel pain. We can go back to what Eve did and all of that. God told Eve this would happen. But look at this. It says because her hour is come. She's in travail. She's in labor. Her hour is come. It's, it's sorrowful. It says but, which is a conjunction, as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remember no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. So in other words, here's what it says. A woman goes through travail. She's feeling going through a lot of pain, but it says the moment she has that baby, looks into the face of that baby, she forget, immediately he removes what she just went through. Now, she's able to say, oh, it was hard. She's able to say, oh, I had some serious contractions, but the exact remembrance, it says that when she looks at the baby, when it comes forth, she forgets. So it is very much possible. Here's, I want you, guys, I can't stress this enough. This is why you don't fall in love with stuff. Because here's what happens in increase. Increase can come, hit your life, and you actually forget the pain of your yesterday. He names his son Manasseh and says, I forgot the toil and my father's house. I'm living so good right now that that stuff that I went through, hey, it ain't even nothing. I ain't, let's use our, our current, but I'm not even tripping about it. This, this is what, this is what he, Joseph said. But let's flip it, too. And Joseph said, I got increase, name him Ephraim. I got increase in the place that I was afflicted. 
God has a way of shifting things in your life. Guys, I promise you, you can get one phone call. You can get one situation take place. And everything that you've been struggling with, you forget. The pain gone. But also, there's a flip side to that as well. Here's why you don't fall in love with stuff. Here's why you don't get arrogant if God increase you externally. Because you can lose everything. And you forget the happiness of what it was like when you had it. I've seen situations where people walk down the aisle and get married, crying, happy, in love with each other. Go spend thousands, tens of thousands of dollars on a wedding. Five years later, they're in court. They're fussing over the stuff that they both obtained together. They're talking about custody, child support. They can't stand each other. They got lawyers involved. It hurts them to look over at the table at the other person. Same person you was in love with. The same person you had children with, you now can't stand. Everything about them hurt you. The stuff was there before, but just, just, just the stench of them, you about to throw up. At one point, you couldn't, no one can pull you away from them. Isn't it amazing that they can hurt you so bad today that you forgot about how good things were yesterday? So it is with, with on the other end. You could be on the martyr bus for 13 years. All of a sudden now, you're able to go and get you a car. Business coming in. One contract can hook you up. How you used to dress, you don't dress like that no more. You used to, used to wear somebody leftover wigs. Now you're able to go and get your own. Can't nobody tell you nothing. Didn't have money for makeup. Now your face is flawless. But you can forget what it was like when you didn't have that stuff. As if you have always been this way. That's why you got to be mature, guys, to be able to handle this stuff. Because here's the thing. That increase, there's, there's some people I'm talking to you right now. You're about to come into a seasonal increase. But it is, it is a season. You have to prepare yourself in case it stops. In other words, here's the thing. You want, to, you want to hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. I'll give you time to write that down. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. If you take that motivation, when the increase start coming, you don't, you, don't, you don't start acting funny. Why? Because you recognize at any given moment, this thing can shift. There are things I had on the table in my life that I was expecting to happen to begin of March. Guess what? Two weeks, a week and a half before corona hit, all of a sudden, the thing, the deadline that I had in March has been pushed all the way back to June, out of my control. So if I were to start acting funny before, watch this, and here's what <laughs> me and old spirit were talking about this, how people can start acting funny with money, but people can start acting funny with the thought of money. The thought, it ain't even hit. If they think it's finna come, they can start acting funny. Start acting funny, start a you know, whole attitude shift. You haven't even got it yet. All of this stuff is a trial. All of these things is God pulling stuff out of our heart. And so, 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 so here's the thing. Um, God can send you a mate, be preparing you for a long time. Guess what? When that person comes, everything can just fast track. Boom. Y'all know y'all made for each other. But I want to hit you with this while I got you. And I, I know when I said marriage is going to grab somebody that's about to go to sleep on me. Have you noticed that? Joseph gets married to this lady, but he names the kid after his struggle. Did you not know that when you marry somebody, you marry all of them, everything that they've been through? So here's this woman, a uh, 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 NASA, who her children is being named not based upon what she's been through. Her children is being named based upon what her husband has been through. At one point in my life, if a person told me that they had been through certain things, automatically I would X them out. Hey, can't deal with you. You got this stuff going on. As I mature, I'm open to the fact that people have been through stuff. And it's not so much have they been through it that is a uh, deal breaker for me. The thing that I'm looking for now is, but have you survived it? Have you matured from it? Have you been healed from it? So it's not so much what you've been through as much as it, how much is it affecting you now? Have you let it go? Have you been healed? Have God removed those scars out of your life? And all of that, to me, is mo is, it, it, it means more than just the experience. 20 years ago, if you tell me this was your experience, I, I'm not fooling with you. Now, where I am in my life, I'm not concerned about what you've been through as much as I am about how is that now affecting you. She got married to this man, but her kids are being named after his experiences. 
Guys, I want you to understand something. At some point, you, you're going to have to mature. You're going to have to mature to the extent whereby it's not just the outside of a person that's attractive. You need to be concerned about what they've been through in life. You need to start watching have they matured. So they tell you, well, I grew up in a family where my, I seen, I seen uh, men beat women. Okay. That doesn't necessarily mean you're going to do that. Maybe you have matured to the fact that you've seen that and you recognize if things don't go my way, I can't act like a child and try to run somebody and start putting my hands on them. What I need to find out is how do you act when you don't get your way? Because you're going to show me if you got tendencies that even though you've seen someone get beat, you may think that that's okay. Or you have said verbally, I'll never do that. But you start acting mighty funny when you don't get your way. You grab me by my arm all of a sudden and say, oh, I didn't mean that. Uh, yes, you did. You just didn't mean for me to see it. In other words, I want to help somebody to understand warning come before destruction. That's scripture. You may be in a situation right now. It just didn't just happen. That person had tendencies, showed you that they are capable of doing certain things before you commit it to the degree that you commit it. And, and here's the thing. You ignore those, those warning signs. Why? Because you wanted what you wanted. Now, you got to be man enough or woman enough that if you have made, put yourself in a lifelong commitment and disregarded the warning signs, you got to now make that thing work. Now, I'm not telling you to be in a situation where a person is being you and they may take your life. I wouldn't tell a person to stick in a situation like that where you can lose your life. No, if that person is, is, is beating on you, I, I'm going to tell you you want to get out of that because I don't, I don't want the blood on, on my hand if that person takes your life. What I am telling you is before you make certain commitments, Make sure you watch the lifestyle of that person because they're going to tell you what they can handle and what they can't handle. And they're, they're going to show you whether or not they have grown from that, if they have matured or if they have healed from that situation. Let us continue. And so now we see verse 53 says, And the seven years of plenty is, watch this, that was in the land of Egypt were ended. Now all that prosperity is over. And the seven years of, of dearth uh, began to come. So the famine hit according as Joseph had said. So he already was aware. When all this stuff was going good, Joseph said, hey man, alright, y'all better sit, sit some stuff back because this ain't going to last forever. It says, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. Because of what Joseph had did, he put a, a savings in place, he put a plan in place that when everything was coming in real good, he, he set some stuff back for the season that it was going to stop. What, look what happened. And now, and verse 55 says, and when all the land of Egypt was famished, that the people cried, watch this, to Pharaoh for bread. Joseph went in every city teaching them his plan. People executed the plan to a certain degree. But when they ran out, who did they call Pharaoh? This is what I love right here. For bread. Pharaoh said unto the Egyptians, look at this, guys. When they ran to Pharaoh about their problem, look what Pharaoh's answer was. Go unto Joseph. Watch this. What he said to you, do. Hold up, hold up. They go to Pharaoh and ask Pharaoh to give them bread. Pharaoh's response is, y'all go to Joseph. Watch this. And whatever Pharaoh, whatever Joseph tell you to do, y'all do that. Look at this promotion, guys. Look at this promotion. Pharaoh turns over all of Egypt to Joseph. He literally does. He says it. But now we see he really did it. He, they came to Pharaoh. Pharaoh referred to Joseph. And then he said, I don't have your answer. Joseph had your answer. Now, he, <laughs> watch this. Let me read this and I'm going to tie all this together. And the famine was, was over all the face of the earth. Now, when you, when you study this, you'll find out that it doesn't necessarily mean it was over the face of the earth. But it basically means that the area that they were in or according to their world, they was in famine. Now, I want you I, and I wanted to put, point that out as I studied this, because I need you to see that in your world, things can be going like this. But in somebody else's world, it's, it can be totally different. Uh, while we're there, I need you to understand if you're looking at me or you may see this later. Someone once asked, well, uh, Pastor Shelly, what can we do? How are we going to stop uh, what's going on with, with people being killed, uh, black males being killed, uh, females are being killed by police and all these things are happening and, and all that is going on with the racism, hate and all of that uh, takes place. What do, we, what do we need to do? Here's the thing that, that I, I truly believe. I truly believe we are limited from a, as a race 
at making change in this direction. I'm not saying we can't. I'm saying we're limited. And here's what I mean. I believe that those who benefit from injustice have the biggest voice when injustice happens. Those, I believe that those who, in, who can benefit from injustice speak out against injustice. They have a greater weight than those who are being uh, mistreated. And here's, here's what I mean. It's one thing for, for a black family to say, don't do this uh, to, to this person in my family. But that's been said hundreds of years. But it seems like it's different if a white person speaks out about the topic and says, we're wrong at how we have treated blacks. Totally different response. So my point is, I believe that we're limited because of the system that we're in called America. Mer America was never founded or grew to benefit black people. Let's, let's, deal, let's deal with the truth of that. It was never set up to benefit a black person. I'm not saying you can't be successful being black. What I'm saying is you're fighting a system that was never set up for you. So when we look at that and really deal with it in the context of what it was really there, so that means that there, there have been uh, uh, things put in place that have locked out people of color. It takes a person who is in that system whose skin color now allows them access that now takes a black person with them along that ride. That's the truth of the matter. Certain things uh, are going to be uh, going to happen. And here's the thing. I believe we can protest. I believe we can talk about it. But until you change the system, it's going to continue to happen. If, a, if an officer is able to on camera take the life of an individual and nothing happens to them outside of administrative pay, paid leave, what's going to stop another person doing it? Now, if that said person is found guilty given 20 years and everybody around that allowed it to happen also get punished, watch this, then we're going somewhere. In other words, the system can change. Unless the system change, because somebody might say, well, you know, well, what about, uh, uh, if you would, I've heard, uh, spoke with people of different persuasions say, well, I hear people saying these things are happening with the police, but what did they do to provoke that? They can't wrap their mind around, I don't have to do anything. You, could, you can have your knee on my neck and I can tell you that I can't breathe. You, a police officer response can be, don't resist. All right, I, stay, I sit still and I don't resist. Now, let's be real. If you're choking me, three seconds can seem like an eternity. So for three seconds, I sit still and you don't stop. Now I yell out again and say, you're still choking me. And your response is, stop resisting. I'm going to die. What can I really do? I complied to your demands. You still throw, threw me to the ground. You put your knee on me. I have three grown men putting pressure on my body, and I tell you, I cannot breathe. Your response to me, you stop resisting. I am not physically resisting, but in your heart, in your mind, you see me as a threat. I'm going to lose my life. That same system has shown you that a person can go into a theater, can go into a school, and massacre kids. Kill 30-some people, children, and teachers, and walk out without a scratch. Walk out without a scratch, is laid on the ground carefully, is handcuffed carefully, put in a car carefully, and, 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 and taken to jail without any harm. So it, that shows me we're in a system that because of the color of my skin, I am, I am criminalized because of how I look. It shows me that a person can have restraint when they want to, regardless of what the crime is. That's what we're living in. But if you're watching me right now, and you're of a white persuasion, you can do more in this topic than I can. I really believe that. Until white America begins to speak out about this injustice, it's going to continue to stay the same. Pastor, do you really feel that? Absolutely. I do it every day. Part of uh, one of our ministers at the church is uh, Tamar, and we deal with sexual abuse. Most of the people that come through are females. Now, I haven't personally been sexual abused, but I fight against sexual abuse. We are very heavy in sex trafficking, even though I haven't been sex trafficked. I have a passion toward it because I see that it runs in my bloodline. My grandmother was a product of a rape. It, it is direct. I have direct family members who have dealt with sexual abuse. But here's what I found out that is true. A woman can say that she's been taken advantage of, she was date raped or raped by a husband, raped by a boyfriend. My male privilege can say you shouldn't have took off your clothes and then decide to change your mind. You put yourself in that situation. Let's go further. You provoked him. You wore 
this particular dress. You had your chest out. You, you, you had your, 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 your butt out. You should not have worn this. Instead of using their male privilege to say rape is rape. Now, here's what I choose to do. I use my male privilege to stand up for those who've been victimized in sexual abuse. So in other words, I have a voice for that woman. And so now I, I have found out that, that I can cause more change if I use my male privilege. Because watch this. Women deal with things that male, men don't have to deal with. I don't walk out to my car worrying about somebody snatching me and raping me. My male privilege gives me that. I could open this church up. I'm not thinking about somebody being here taking advantage of me. My male privilege affords me that. But if I speak out against stuff that mo more uh, uh, perpetrators have been male against women and then go back to that male and say, hey, I don't care what she says. It, uh, no means no. I carry more weight. I want to stop for a minute and open the opportunity for a question. This question is from Melody Benford. When you're in your season of increase and you realize it's a season, but you have others that just see the increase, how do you still be a blessing to others without using up your resources? Great question, Melody. Uh, she, she mentioned how do you... Uh, pretty much stay the course when you see other people pulling on you. Well, here's, here's one of the things that I, I want to suggest that has to happen, that I would suggest that, that this is what I see is normally the uh, uh, tool that the enemy used to, to rob people of their season of increase when other people that they care about come and ask them for, for certain things. Uh, the, the main thing that, that, that you need to make sure you get delivered from is the need to be needed. I want to say that again. You want to get delivered from the need to be needed. Now, what you got to understand, if you're saying that you're, you want God to use you to be a blessing to a person, here's what Scripture says. The blessing of the Lord is rich and it adds no sorrow. Now, we can think we're blessing them. Watch this and be careful of this. This is why we have to mature and get, get delivered in certain things. We can think that we're being a blessing to them because they have a request and we have the means to meet that request. Here's where I see a problem. To give a person or sow into a person's life without the leading of the Holy Spirit can be very dangerous. Because here's the thing that you got to understand. That person belongs to God, not us. Whether it be our kids, whether it be our sisters, brothers, whether it be our friends that, that have been around. That person belongs to God. Now, here's the thing that I want to encourage you, you guys to do. I dare you, before you hand out, step back, remove your emotions out of the picture, and seek God and ask him for, you, for direction. Now, I have, a, I have a son who uh, believes, and, and some of you may believe this, if it's mine, I have the right to do whatever I want to with it. This is something that he said. And here's the thing I, he did not know. I had something that I was contemplating giving him. But the moment he made that statement helped me to realize that he, had, he, he is yet to get it. So I'm holding back what I prefer to do for him. Because I recognize I cannot cast pearls before swine. In other words, it doesn't do any good to take a pearl necklace that have value, put it around a, a hog. Why? Because the hog has a hog nature. He's going to go to the pen. He's going to be in the mud. He's still going to do things even though I put a pearl necklace around him. That is what we're doing with family members. I'm not calling your, your people a pig, anything like that. Hear, hear me in the context. What I am saying, people can ask for things that they're really not ready for. And people can also ask for things that would keep them from trusting God. And so what we think we're blessing them, we actually delay in calamity because once you give it to them and it runs out, they find themselves in that situation again. You want to know why? Because they never matured. They wasn't ready. And so those of you who believe that you have a gift and a grace to give, I, I want to suggest that you pull back. I'm a giver, but I don't mind saying no. Why do, why do I say no? I don't say no because I don't want to do it. I say no because I recognize they're not ready for it. And so many times, and here's the thing I want you to be aware of as well. A person that's really a giver, it hurts them to say no because they would prefer to give, especially when you see a person struggling in an area that you used to struggle in. And you knew what it was like to struggle in that. And you say, man, if I just had somebody just to give me $20, things would have been better. And you want to go out and hand out $20. That's great unless God is using their situation to, to draw them closer to him. So you don't want to uh, get to that place of, of increase, that season of increase, and you show God that you can't handle being trustworthy. Watch this, to be a steward of what he's placing in your hand. Going back to what I said with my child, he don't understand it's about being a steward. No matter what is put in your hand, 
you got to understand I'm only a steward. How I handle this, how I treat this will indicate whether or not I'm ready for the next level. Um, as we as we as we looked at this again, um, as we we're closing out with the famine was all over Egypt. Watch this, guys. I'm in verse 56 and the famine was all over the face of the earth. Joseph opened all this. Watch this. He opened all the storehouses. Now, you remember, he'd been stacking up and he sold unto the Egyptians. Whoa. And the famine went sore in the land of Egypt and all the countries came into Egypt. Bracket this off to Joseph. It didn't say they came into Egypt. To Pharaoh, they came into Egypt to Joseph. For what reason? For it to buy corn because the famine was so sore in the land. Now, here, here's something I want to drop into your heart to help you to see how important maturity is. Joseph, watch this, has now started a business. He didn't just give them, going back, watch this, Melody. He did not just give them corn because they asked. He did not just give them bread because they asked. He sold it to them. Be careful when you give somebody something and it hasn't, they haven't paid a price for it. The chances are they won't value it. Excuse me. Watch this. Joseph stood, he, he stored up, but it was, when it was time to divvy out, he made everybody buy it. He made it cost them something. When you give people things without it costing them, it's a strong possibility they may not value it. Now, it didn't say that he hit them with a big premium. But he did charge them something. Here is what people cannot stand. It's, let's use going back to talk about systematic racism. What about how we treat each other? You have a person, you have people that can go into business and feel more comfortable buying from somebody else who look different. Doesn't mean their product is better. But you have already, watch this, we can say that people look at us and form a certain opinion. Here's the truth of the matter. Everybody Look at people and form an opinion. The Bible says man looks on, on the outer appearance, but God looks at the heart. Everybody forms opinion. But here's the thing. I recognize that some people are more comfortable buying from other people. Because they have already got in their mind, if I go and support a black business, they're not going to have good service. Or, watch this, they will go somewhere, spend three times the amount, but go to a person of color. And, and now, watch this, they, if the person of color say we're charging $19.99, a person somewhere else is twenty nine ninety nine. They will walk in that black uh, per person of color establishment and try to talk them down off the nineteen ninety nine. Are you with them for an hour? Go down the street, spend uh, another ten dollars at another establishment, same product, but they are they are more comfortable buying it from somebody else of another persuasion. And also, it, this is this is also true. You can deal with a, a person of color business. They are just starting out. Guess what, guys? They are going to make mistakes. You don't even give them a grace period to get it right. You go in, you, you say, I'm supporting black. The moment they don't give you good service, you go lie and say, don't fool with them no more. Go down the street, a person who don't like you, and you'll support them. And as soon as somebody asks where you get it from, you will support that other business. Man, I don't fool with us because we don't do right. Here's the truth of the matter. You're right. There are some bad business businesses. I don't care what color you are. Let's let's deal let's deal with that elephant in the room. But you also have to be concerned considering this. How about pulling that person to the side and say, you know what, I'm gonna support you. I really want to support you. Let's say it this way. But y'all gotta do better at your y'all customer service. You your your sign say y'all open at eight. You didn't get here to eight thirty. That's bad business. Now, I'm not yelling at you, I'm not disrespecting you, I'm not going live. To try to get views. I want to tell you woman and woman. A man and man. Listen. In order for you to get bet to do better at this. Here's some things I want to suggest that you do. You say you open up at 8. How about your staff is already in there at 730. How about at 759. I see you at the door unlocking the door. Not that I got to wait outside of your shop for an extra 30 minutes. In order for you to come. That's bad business. Have you ever thought about talking to a person before you you dog them? What if what if they are the first person, first true offering in their family and they're trying to be an entrepreneur, but they don't have they haven't been trained, they haven't been mentored. All they know that they have a dream on the inside of them. How about doing that? Can I tell you another secret? That the black the, the black dollar goes out a whole lot faster than any other persuasion. That means you're going somewhere and buying from somebody that don't look like you. 
How about that? Let's be. So now, so this is what I want you to understand. That's not a white issue. That's not, that's not an Asian issue. That's not an any issue. That's a black issue. You're choosing to buy somewhere else. Well, I went here and they just got bad customer service. The place wasn't clean. They wasn't this and this. Hey, hey, I'm with you. I'm with you. Everybody had those experiences. But here's the thing I want to challenge you. Have you ever told them without being disrespectful how bad the, the service was? Have you gave them tips on improving? And you went back again the next day. I, when, when I'm out somewhere and I'm, uh, a person is serving me, I'm going to give them a tip regardless of the service. Regardless. Now, if their service is bad, guess what I'm going to say to them? Hey, I'm going to give you this. Watch this grace. I don't even think you deserve what I'm finna hand you. Here's what I want to suggest. The first 10 minutes, you did great. The moment you gave me my food, you filled my cup up one time. You never came back to check on me. I saw you on your phone. I saw you go over there and deal with them. Hey, you can't treat people that way. And go ahead and sign the tip. Here's what I'm hoping. That they receive increase even though they wasn't ready. You want to know why I, I choose to sow that? Because I recognize there may be areas in my life I'm not ready. And God still allowed me to, to receive increase. Guys, I want to help you understand this. Whatever you sow is, is what you reap back. Now, I'm with you. I recognize I got some things right now that I want to do in people's lives, but I recognize they can't handle it. I recognize it would be more of a detriment than it would be a blessing. I recognize that. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm not going to deal with them in that, in that wise. I'm willing to talk to them. I'm willing to help them understand here's why I'm not going to fool with you in this area. But I'm not. It, but it's not about, here's the thing, me going on live and putting it out there and say, hey, I'm not fooling with this person. They doing this, this, and this. No, it's not about that, guys. You got to understand, we're dealing with something that has been in existence, in, in existence for hundreds of years. It's not going to change in one day. It's not going to change in one hashtag. But here's what I want to leave you with. I believe that there, there's about to be a shift in resources. Uh, notice what happened with Joseph. Joseph was a Hebrew in the land of the Egyptians. He said, Ephraim, God has allowed me to prosper in the place that I was afflicted. I believe, and this is not about, I'm, I'm not excluding anyone, but I need you to hear my heart for those who are hearing this. I believe that there's going to be a shift in the black community as it relates to our perception and perspective as it deals with the dollar, as it deals with income, as it deals with increase. I believe that this is, God is preparing you for something that's going to happen. I truly believe change cannot take place unless you start dealing with the economic side of things. I really believe this. Here's also something that I need you to, to, to recognize as well, and I want to speak to this person. There's a person who deals with finances. Uh, you may be a, a CFO. You may be a CPA. Uh, and here's the, something I need you to understand. The moment of, of, of famine, or let's say what we're dealing with right now, is your opportunity to build your value. Uh, it's one thing that, that te show me how to uh, handle my money when I got a lot of it. But it's another thing to give me a plan when I don't have it. So there's some people that God is allowing you to see the grace that you're able to take people in a time of famine and help them prosper. Watch this. This is what I'm telling you. To prosper in the time of famine. And God is showing you how strong that grace is on you. No, it, it's not you, you. You're good with numbers. You're good with uh, saving. You're good with putting things up. You're, it's, it's like things attract you. God is showing you that he's giving you a grace of resources and finances. Here's something that also I want you to understand. And I, I want to give a shout out to our CFO as, as dealing with our church and ministry. We when we hit uh, this pandemic, here's the thing. Our CFO began to go out and find resources and programs that immediately we can be a part of. And she began to bring back to me different suggestions on what we could do. And now, what, going back to what I shared before again, I still had to find a decision because I'm the, C, I'm the CEO. But she brought, look, if we go, here's choice A. If you choose choice A, here's the benefit, pros and cons, choice B, choice C. All of these things. And here's what our testimony is. And my heart go out to those who, who this is not your testimony. But I can tell you this. We haven't had a, a live service to where we had people in, in months. We have not missed anything on any bills. 
we have uh, not only have we we had uh, resources to come in, we've been able to save. Now, how are you able to save during the pandemic when you are relying on people to give? Now, not it's not like a regular uh, 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 entrepreneurship piece. You have to rely on other people to give. How is it that our ministry been able to save during this season? Now, it's the grace of God. It's the glory of God. I give credit to that. But it's also the wisdom of our CFO. My point is this. You need to make sure that you have people around you that are gifted and not just you like them because their gifting and their anointing is going to show up. In times of suffering. Also, I want to leave you with this and I'm going to let you go. We talked about people having a troubled spirit. As it deals with our resources, with my businesses, my CFO, Grace, on, on her life has brought peace in places that I should have a troubled spirit. That's how you know you're anointed. And I want to leave you with this. This is how you know you're anointed and whatever it is that you claim that you'll do, that you're called to do. Are you bringing peace in the life of a person who should have a troubled spirit. Not happiness. Happiness is something happening. Are you bringing peace to their spirit? Something is going on in their life. They should have a troubled spirit. But because of what's on you, you're bringing peace to their troubled spirit. That's how you can gauge where your anointing lies. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt, my CFO is anointed. How do we know? During time of famine, we've been able to not only pay what we need to pay, pay it on time. Everybody that's employed under me has not missed a paycheck. Matter of fact, our CFO has introduced them to programs that they can qualify for that not only they can get their paycheck, but they also can get other resources. They are doing better during a famine than before the famine. That's the grace of God. That's the anointing of God. But her seeking God, using the grace on her life, has brought peace where we should have chaos. That's how you know you're anointed. I don't know who it is that has joined in on today, but what I want you to see, sir, ma'am, maybe God has chosen you to be a first fruit offering. Maybe he's called you to go into an area that nobody in your bloodline has went into before. Maybe God has shown somebody here, whether you can be a CFO, you can be a CPA, or you may be running the finances of your own household. This is your time for your anointing to increase. Whatever it is that you've been called to do, I want to pray for you. That the glory of God shall shine up in your life and that his power shall uh, come forth. Uh, we, we started, uh, was seeking to start at, at 7. We was on YouTube. YouTube would not pick up uh, our feed. Went through this for 30, uh, 20, 30 minutes. But here's what I recognize. I believe that there's somebody who's watching me now. You're watching me live on Facebook. But had we been on YouTube, we would have missed you. My point is this. I embraced the process. I wasn't panicking. I wasn't nervous. I want to say this and hear my context. I really didn't care. Why? Because I know that God sees my world, but he also sees outside world. And there's somebody that's listening to me now. Had we been on our normal routine, you would have missed this. But God has spoke to your heart. He's ministered to you today. He's given you some keys that you need to walk into uh, as this next level coming to your life. So I pray that the grace of God and the power of God will flood your heart. I pray that the thing that he's pre preparing you for will cause you to draw closer to him like never before. That you will seek him for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding as you prepare yourself for a season of increase. That he will give you a plan now that you can execute later. I pray that you will not uh, get high-minded high minded or exalt or, or begin to look at yourself more highly than you ought to as he begin to increase your life. Because here's the thing you recognize is only for a season. May you use the wisdom of God and the glory of God as he elevates you, that his glory shall be seen in your life. This I ask in Jesus' name. Thank you for tuning in. May God bless you.